Thank you for being here. This is an odd session. It's got some experimental qualities, and I'm really appreciative of everyone who's in the room. If you came, if you came, since you came, I know you to be people I would like very much if I don't know you. Uh, the ones I do know, I really appreciate that, but I know that everybody who made the choice to be here is somebody who has character traits that I will like, that I do like. Uh, I want to remind you that there's a session, Donna Murch has put together a panel of protesters from Ferguson, and at 8 o'clock on Saturday, that is in the schedule, but it was added after some of the official announcements went out. So 8 o'clock on Saturday after the presidential reception, Donna Murch will speak from Rutgers, will speak on historicizing Ferguson, and we will hear from some of the from the local folks on that. So I hope you can join us at that. And really important uh, to say is Saturday, well, as important, equally important, Saturday, uh, there will be a session from 1050 to 1220 on tenured and contingent historians together, question mark, why it matters. And that is AC 106. And that is a very good place to go as a follow-up conversation to what we're having today. Um, oh, that's for another event, okay. This is not just about adjunct, contingent, and part-time faculty, though it is certainly about that, and I'll speak a little bit about the origins of my interest in doing this session. Oh, by the way, hi, I'm Patty Limerick. I forgot to say the president. Briefly, the president. Tomorrow night at 7, no longer the president. So, okay, that's a little personal self-indulgence there. Anyway, uh, we are also as interested in the relations between and among academic historians and public historians, and between and among teachers and community colleges, K through 12 classrooms and universities and liberal arts colleges. This is a conversation where we hope to get a conversation, maybe not started, because it has happened in fragmented ways, but brought into a larger zone of communication. It is certainly not a place where we anticipate getting the conversation concluded and finished. Our wonderful, wonderful colleague on the executive board of the organization American Historians, Jim Barrett from the University of Illinois, is not able to be with us today, but we have a very fine document that he wrote giving his own thoughts. This is not an OAH position paper, but his own thoughts about where we might go with issues of contingent part-time and adjunct. So that will be available and we'll pass that out as a document for people to have in mind as we reflect on this session, uh, at the end of the session. But it is really something we see as starting where we're going. Quintard Taylor is not up here. Quintard Taylor from the University of Washington has a, a fairly intense respiratory affliction and he will be fine, but the doctor really said, don't do this, don't travel. Now, I had tried to, here's a confession, which I might not have made explicitly, uh, Quintard had been able to be here. There is numerical disproportion on this panel in the representation of full professors, or there was going to be, with uh, Quintard and Johan Neem, both full professors. I didn't want any full professors in the room to feel any opportunity to feel defensive or condemned or have any temptation to prickliness, and so I thought having a couple of them up here would be a way of doing, reducing that. Uh, so I shall from time to time have to appear in my role. I'll be moderator, but I also will occasionally probably speak as a full professor as my late First husband used to say, Jeff Limerick, when, it, when someone would say, well, she's a full professor, Jeff Limerick would say, full of what? So, <laughs> ho, ho. <laughs> I think we know the answer to that one. Um, the, this session, now the origins of this session. Last year, Kathy Finley, the executive director, organized a meeting, called a meeting at 8 o'clock on Sunday in Atlanta of the chairs of committees, of OAH committees. That seemed tough to get up early on the Sunday, the last day of the convention, and attend a meeting of the committee chairs. Then it turned out to be a spectacular meeting that I think all of us who were there genuinely treasured. 
the opportunity to get up at 8 o'clock on a Sunday morning at the convention and attend that meeting uh, because it turned out there had been very, there had been almost nothing in the way of opportunities for these different committees in the OAH representing different constituencies for them to be represented in each other's company and to talk about their common, common enterprise. So it was really quite an exhilarating session. And the interest and enthusiasm and the exclamations of the rarity of this opportunity for us to know more about community college teachers or to know more about the world of the public historian, that we were just um, exhilarated with that. So I had the idea that I wanted to follow up on that and have that conversation in a larger room with more participants. I also have spent time in really, I will just have to say, kind of empty self-reproach uh, as a full professor, thinking about the situation of contingent, adjunct, and part-time faculty. And so I thought I could bring an opportunity to reflect on that dilemma in our profession together with this talking across the borders of our occupations and so on. Fortunately, I didn't just jump in and make this plan only in my own head. I consulted this person, Donald Rogers, who's the chair of the contingent part-time adjunct. I'm getting their name wrong. Am I wrong? It's or CPAC. C committee on part-time adjunct and committee. Employment. I was going to put the word committee at the end. Okay, so CPAC, uh, committee on part-time adjunct and part. No, <laughs> I'm sorry. I do too much stuff with federal agencies and my acronym. Uh, there are too many. Ac what is the committee? The committee is the committee on part-time adjunct and contingent employment. That's what I meant to say. So there we are. Uh, sorry for, for flubbing that. So I consulted with Donald, and I had a pretty um, sharp-edged set of opening comments. I was going to, I thought I would give it this session. I thought I would compare the employment world of the, of higher education, especially now. I would compare that to the dual wage economy of the American West in the 19th century and the early 20th century of skilled laborers and people often defined by various forms of social difference working hard and getting a lower rate of pay. Uh, so it was going to be a pretty confrontational opening there, but Donald just stayed on me with the keep it focused on community, keep it focused on how we might know each other better and consider the impacts of our circumstances of employment on our capacity to do the most for the field of history. So that's where this came from. Donald, in a message said, and I do want to accent this as a goal of the session, to consider whether and how the composition and structure of the modern historical community complicates that community's mission to promote historical knowledge and understanding. I will add, this is me, not him. Um, we did use that word community a lot, the historical community. I hope that has meaning. I don't really know. Maybe by the end of the session I'll have a uh, conviction that that term has concrete meaning. In order to talk about the uh, subtitle, Activating Empathy, to get our panelists with some common ground on that subject, I contacted a friend in the social psychology department on my campus, and I asked the friend for some suggestions on reading. And he um, put us in touch with a few more folks, and we ended up with a quite remarkable article by a man named Jamil Zaki at, at Stanford called Empathy, a, motiv uh, a Motivated Account. It was published just last year in 2014. It is an article about the context in which empathy is, is made possible and when it is squished. Uh, rather than thinking of empathy as an automatic response people have to others in dilemmas or distress, Zaki speaks of the motivation that can bring people to embrace empathy or to flee it. The key role of motivation in driving people to avoid or approach engagement with other people's dilemmas, other people's situations, that's what Zaki focuses his article on. Uh, uh, so that when people succeed in crossing group boundaries to pay attention directly and not defensively to the circumstances and dilemmas of others, that's what we're talking about with empathy here. And Zaki in his article is very attentive to the situations in which people make that move across borders and when they do not. In essence, he says, observers often put themselves in or take themselves out of empathy's way. 
so uh, his, um, that, that is his general principle here that uh, empathy, people will tend to select themselves out of empathy inducing situations if their motivational structure is in that direction or they can put themselves in empathy inducing situation. All of these folks who would do it by nature anyway have been dragooned into an empathy producing situation and they were very gracious, I'll speak of them in a moment, and taking this up. And yet, as Zaki points out, even when empathy is painful for the person feeling the empathy, people still often seek it out. So that is our situation, is to follow up on this idea of empathy as we talk about several questions we've prepared for this occasion. Empathy can serve as a vital psychological prompt to improving others' well-being, Zaki says. And that is our hope that out of this comes some uh, putting our shoulders to the wheel. Empathy is a vital emotional force that scaffolds everything from close relationships to large-scale cooperation, Zaki says. So those are the, so the panelists are free to refer to our readings or not to refer to our readings, but that's the framework of what we arrive on our panel with. Um, in 2001, Kenneth Jackson was president of the organization American Historians and he gave a talk on the dilemmas of the profession and it was very blunt. And I'm going to use his quotation to transition into our panelist engagement. Here he is uh, speaking of the topic of adjunct um, faculty and income inequality within the profession. We are developing a class or caste system within our institutions. At the top are the few stars who have secure positions, generous salaries, numerous ways to make money on the side, and a steady stream of graduate students coming to them. In the middle are tenured teachers who have security, but few prospects for outside offers or internal advancement. And at the bottom of the occupational structure is the historical profession's version of migratory farm workers or temps, instructors who are at the mercy of enrollment patterns and sudden changes in the economic climate. Now, what of course for our purposes today is flawed in that is that we don't have public historians uh, with the direct recognition of K through 12 teachers. And so this is not what you see as a comprehensive statement for our panel, but it is something to point out. He gave that speech in 2001. 15 years, 14 years later. So we hope that this session will have uh, an impact in ways that we can't anticipate. So what I am not going to uh, introduce each panelist because I think that will, biographical emerge, information should emerge out of their comments in response to the questions. And I think it will be really a better experience for all to hear who they are from them in their own voices. I'll just say, and we are in, alphabetical order, the only thing that brings order to my life, except for uh, I'm not in alphabetical order. So at the far end of the table is uh, Dr. Darlene Antezana. She is a professor and chair at Prince George uh, Community College in Largo, Maryland. Next to her is Dr. Robert Good, who is a teacher at Ledoux Horton Watkins High School here in St. Louis. Next to him, well, there's a, there's a grad or a fellow affiliate or something there. Uh, then there's, next to him is Dr. Johan Neem, who is a professor, tenure professor, full professor at Western Washington University. Uh, there's a Kath, Dr. Catherine Ott, who is the curator at the Division of Science and Medicine at the Museum of American History at the Smithsonian Institution. Next to me is my collaborator in designing this session. Dr. Donald Rogers, adjunct lecturer in history at Kinetic, Central Connecticut State College University, Housatonic Community College, University of New Haven, and chair of the OAH Committee on Part-Time Adjunct and Contingent Employment. It has, helps me a lot to have it printed out in front of me. I did that really well there this time. And co-creator of this plenary session. And then, of course, we hope to have Quintard Taylor, but we don't have him. So we're going to just leap right in with the questions that we put together, and we don't really know, maybe we'll just reverse alphabetical order and go in this, this direction. Uh, the first question, and we have at least four or five that we hope to cover and then to go to audience questions and participation. The first one is not an easy one. Uh, what do you make of the following proposition? That, and here's the proposition. The history profession has become a stark case study in income inequality and in rigid boundaries of status and prestige. Donald. Oh, but you'd prefer that. The history profession 
profession has changed a lot in the last 80 years. I mean, 80 years ago, I, the focus of the profession was on uh, the academy, mainly white male professors. Uh, and uh, over the course of the past 80 years, of course, it's broadened out uh, to recognize uh, uh, women in the profession, uh, people of color, min other minorities, um, uh, high school teachers, community college professors. So in that respect, I think you know, the, the, the profession has in many ways become more democratized. But if we just look at the academic part of the profession, uh, I think there is no doubt that it has become uh, a study in income inequality and rigid boundaries. Um, you probably are very familiar with uh, uh, some of the uh, statistics. Um, uh, 1970, according to the Department of Education, Federal Department of Education, 78% uh, of uh, uh, faculty in universities and colleges um, were full-time uh, tenured. Um, nowadays, it's about 25%. Um, 1970, 22% uh, of faculty were uh, part-timers. Uh, today, they're about 50%. Um, and so uh, what's happened over the course of the, the past uh, uh, 40, 50 years since the 1960s is that um, the tenured uh, segment of the academy has significantly shrunk while the contingent part of the faculty has expanded. Um, so about 25% uh, tenure track or tenured faculty and either 50% uh, part-time or full-time temporary. And uh, recent studies uh, have suggested, particularly a recent uh, Colorado State University Center for Academic Labor survey suggests that this is even creeping into research institutions. Um, um, the percentage of part-time faculty may have somewhat leveled off, but there's now an expansion of uh, con uh, uh, temporary full-time faculty, uh, even in uh, research institutions. Um, now, out of this comes what some people call a two-tiered faculty or a bifurcated faculty uh, or a caste system uh, where you know, we have two, at least two layers of uh, tenure and tenure track faculty and a permanent um, uh, proletariat of um, uh, adjunct instructors. Um, and uh, you're probably familiar with uh, many of the problems, uh, poor compensation and benefits. A uh, 2012 uh, survey by the Coalition on the Academic Workforce found that the median uh, income for uh, part-time faculty was $25,000 to $30,000 a year. Uh, job security, insecurity, uh, without, uh, with a few exceptions, uh, most part-time faculty are hired course by course, semester by semester. Um, this one is very important, permanency, um, lack, of, lack of upward job mobility. I think that it's, you know, it's come to, you know, we can recognize that this seems that a large portion of academia will be part-time. That seems to be somewhat permanent. What I think is not fully recognized is many of the people who hold these jobs have also become permanent in those jobs. Um, the Coalition on the Academic Workforce study uh, found uh, that in it, the, just about 11,000 uh, faculty, part-time faculty responded to the survey uh, nationwide. About 56% of them had worked six years or more uh, in part-time status. Uh, and that most of them were in the age range of 46 to 65. So th th these folks are somewhat like me. I'm a part-time faculty member. I've been teaching part-time mostly since 1992. Uh, I teach at three institutions. In fact, I'm not at New Haven this semester. I'm at Albertus Magnus. That's my third school. So I, they call me a, a Rhodes Scholar, R-O-A-D-S. <laughs> um, and uh, so a large minority of us are in that position. Uh, devaluation and lack of support for adjuncts work as uh, teachers uh, and scholars. Um, isolation, I think very important, isolation and exclusion from uh, uh, faculty governance uh, uh, at their institution. And I think uh, all this raises just really serious questions about uh, how we operate as a historical community. It's partly a question about e equity. Uh, the fair treatment of professional people with professional training uh, to have decent lives, a middle class standard of living, uh, and be able to practice their profession. But I think it also raises serious questions about the ability of us to function as a, as a, as a professional community. So I most certainly think that uh, uh, we have become a stark case of income inequality. Well, thank you, Patty and Donald, for putting this together and for confusing me sufficiently in the advancement of it to figure out what we were supposed to talk about. But um, yes, I know I had him. Um, but it's not the way I usually think about empathy. So that's a good thing. I'm, I'm being complimentary. 
<laughs> yes, right, right, right. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I think the statement is pretty true um, based on no data other than anecdotal observation of my own. But in regard to income inequality and no paths to ad advancement and the issues that Donald was just laying out, um, I think the profession reflects the United States in general in all of the issues that are outside of the academy as well. And this includes adjuncts and contingency faculty as well, but I would also add um, administrative and office staff, librarians, archivists, the facilities people, and others in the workplace, often students who get paid next to nothing. They are also part of this, an important part of this, and that also includes the contractors that public history institutions and that museums and park service use and on a part-time or seasonal basis. But it's the second part of the statement that really interests me, the, the part about status and prestige. I, th I think it comes at the topic from an kind of an antiquated, kind of like academic antiquated point of view. Um, the assumption that everyone shares the same understanding of status and prestige that getting a teaching job at an Ivy or a so-called first tier school is what everyone strives for and what everyone values. And, and I, I think hiring committees at large research universities and small liberal arts colleges often look more favorably upon such candidates because they were taught to want that or because they themselves are that. But the proposition assumes the corporate ladder of academia equals the history profession, and it doesn't. Um, status and prestige from where I am situated are not based on where you teach or who publishes your work or who you were in graduate school with, so you can just call them up when you need to. Your, the, your homosocial reproductive power, I guess, if you want to think of it that way. Um, it's based more on creativity and capacity to connect with visitors. That's where prestige in my side of the work comes from. Your ability to work on a team and um, to um, communicate what you know. The capacity to really affect lives is where the prestige comes from. Also, in, in uh, in my IMO, in my opinion. <laughs> um, public history is where all the action is. It's where people catch history, catch the history fever when they're young. Um, and by the time you get them in your classes, we've already had them. We're the ones who started it all. So um, we get them first. So I think public history and community college is where really things are really happening. Um, so yeah. Well, thank you all for being here, and thank you for having me. Um, some of what I was going to say has just been said by the first two, and so I won't, I won't say it all, but I, but I agree, and I speak from the perspective of, of the professoriate, that, that we have become a profession that, has, that is a stark case study in income inequality and rigid boundaries of status and prestige. We know that, that when tenure was first developed, the AAUNP included both economic security and academic freedom as the considerations. Those two went together. Um, both of those are threatened. Um, um, history salaries have followed, professor salaries have followed the same trends as American salaries. We have a 1%. We have a smaller and smaller middle class at, at various non-elite institutions who have tenure. And then we have a growing number of poorly paid or adjunct working poor. And so we look a lot like America, and, and we should think about what that means. The prestige question, I think, is important, and I think an important issue was raised about how the discipline, meaning this organization, offers prestige, because there's two economies of prestige. In an institution, you can get prestige through good teaching, in the case of a university, or through service to the institution or other things. There are ways to gain status and prestige. 
But within the discipline, we know that prestige is based on scholarly productivity and influence. And one can question that status, the legitimacy of that being the source of prestige, but one can also ask for the health of the discipline, how do we make sense of the fact that for a community of historians, the resources we need to engage in scholarly inquiry, to criticize each other, and to develop good knowledge are so unevenly distributed. And those major resources, in addition to academic freedom, of course, are simple things that are easy to get, like time and money. And so I think that, as simple as that sounds, um, that's a real question. If we want a healthy discipline, we need to think about the redistribution or a more egalitarian distribution of time and money for scholarly production and scholarly activities. And so I raise that as a question. Um, if we maintain the current prestige hierarchy of the discipline, how do we make the access to the resources necessary for it more equal? And I'll stop there for now. I'd like to add my thanks, and, and it's fun to be up here. And I guess this is when I make, do I make people defensive now? or? Um, <laughs> Uh, I want to separate both the income and, uh, and then the prestige issue because I think both what Catherine and Johan, uh, Johan just said are really important. Um, from the standpoint of a K through 12 teacher, I think we have to admit in, in public education at least, uh, our salaries are actually fairly stable and we have good pensions for the most part. It's not like it's great, um, but there is a stability there. The issue, um, and what you had just mentioned about knowledge production and the importance of that and prestige, I think in this institution, um, that is really critical. And, and the history, the history community as well. Um, however, to build a community, I think prestige needs to be sort of equally distributed across different locations, so that there's history production and then there's history distribution. I'm kind of in the distribution end of the uh, the game, and and so I want to thank. I mean, OAH is a great location for that. They they have done more than most institutions that I know, made up of of, of uh, people in the academia to reach out to K through 12 um, uh, institutions. They, there was a magazine that was particularly targeted towards uh, K through 12 teachers. Uh, there is an award, uh, the uh, Takao Teacher Award, um, and there there are even K through 12 teachers on panels. So, wow, um, that's kind of an exciting thing. Um, however, you know, on the flip side of that is to what degree? So the invitation is made, but at the same time, where is status and prestige seen? So that the the, the business of teaching. Um, while maybe given lip service. Uh, so the, the story I, I have to share is I was on a panel with three other Takao teacher uh, awardees um, in San Francisco, and I don't know if it was a bad time, but we actually had more people on the panel than we had in the room. Um, and that may have been some of your other experiences as well, but it was just sort of raised an existential question. And so going back to what um, uh, Catherine was saying, you know, I think people do get caught up in prestige, and, and I think it you know, can be a, a lost game in that respect, but if we want to build a community, I, recognizing that I, I need you to be, you know, I need the, the people that have the time to sit in rooms and, and think and write to produce things for me to think about, but also to recognize that back and forth, that, that how do we communicate with each other to get that out, so. Okay, in the interest of full disclosure, I am a tenured full professor. <laughs> One of Many community colleges don't do that anymore, <clears throat> but I am at a community college. And one of the things that we who are at community colleges, the majority of us started as an adjunct. You know, we worked our way up. Community colleges are usually a lot more forgiving and in hiring uh, an adjunct into a full-time position. And as chair of the department, you know, at my, my institution, uh, I am well aware of uh, my far more adjuncts that I have than I do full-time people and what the situation is with them. Um, you also have to figure into this laws. Uh, the Affordable Care Act has seriously impacted what we can do with adjuncts, the number of hours that we can give them. Um, state laws also play into that. The state of Maryland has a bunch of legislators who feel that they need to uh, pass all sorts of laws governing what we do in the profession. 
Now, is there prestige? Well, you know, um, the, the, the issue of taboos uh, is our session is, oh, what, you're teaching at a community college. And it has always been, for a great many years, the idea that you're teaching at a community college means that you just weren't good enough to go to a four-year school. Or some reason was that, you know, you just couldn't make it there. Although many of us have actually taught at a four-year school. Um, the flip side of that is although you need a master's degree to teach at a community college, many of our community colleges now, when we do search committees, we are going to hire a PhD. You know, that we were looking at that. And many of our faculty, you know, are PhDs in, in, in this world. The economy and the inequality of pay means that we get more people approaching us for a position than we ever did before because they, it, the positions aren't there for four-year institutions. Uh, the inequality of pay, yeah, okay. Adjuncts do not get paid what they're worth. You know, that's the bottom line to that. They don't get benefits. Um, the Affordable Care Act has pretty much cut that one out altogether. Uh, that, you know, the, on the other hand, we have our president who is really promoting community colleges. Um, in our case, for our president, he has actually made an example of her and what we do. So is it static? Yeah, to a lot degree, but that really depends upon where you are, um, what state you're in, what part of the state you're in, how many institutions are there for you to uh, apply to, what is the status, and an interesting concept came out of our workshop this morning when we were talking about adjuncts and um, how adjuncts are seen at different institutions. And in one case, um, one of the, the uh, members at our workshop you know, was discussing that at one institution, they're all herded into one room. They don't have uh, you know, a separate office. They are not asked and not expected and don't not wanted at department meetings or other committee meetings. And yet on another institution, they are encouraged to engage in all of that. Um, so have we actually really looked at empathy and how we deal with um, adjuncts and contingent and part-time? No, I don't think we really have. I think that this is an opening, really, to make that discussion there and what, what do we do with them? Okay. Okay. We're moving to the next question and this time we're changing from the ma magicness of <laughs> alphabetical order. Uh, and really what you have to do now, panelists, is you must take off from the remark made by the previous speaker as you, so which is good because, I mean, this what you just did here was wonderful for opening remarks. So, so I'm grateful for that and I'm sad that I went defensive, Catherine, when I thought you were <laughs> criticizing that and I'm going to be on patrol to watch that. So the next question, uh, and this gets to the core of what Donald has directed us to in this session. In what ways does the current employment picture for historians affect the capacity of the historical community to provide historical knowledge and understanding in society? So how does this inequality and peculiar arrangement of status and, and prestige, how does that, I suppose you have to say enhance, I'm not sure that will play in there, but it enhance or reduce our capacity to do what we want to do, which is get history out into the world and where people can pay attention to it. And uh, who, uh, is there anyone who would like to start us off on? All right, I, I will, I'll address this. <laughs> um, the employment picture for part-time contingent adjunct means that there is no guarantee from one semester, oh, okay. There's no guarantee from one semester to another that they actually have a job. Uh, the flip side of that is that you might be offering X number of sections to be taught in a particular semester. And you don't really have the adjuncts who can teach it. You're, you may have a very slim full-time department, which is, I do. And then you've got to come scrambling at the last minute because an adjunct took a full-time position. Um, I have a lot of... Um, uh, just recently uh, graduated PhDs or people in PhD programs. And when they're offered a full-time position someplace, naturally that's where they're going to go. And so you're scrambling to find somebody to fill that, often on a time period that you're not really looking at all the applications that you actually could look at. You need to get that body in there in two weeks' time or whatever. So perhaps 
the hiring and you know looking at an application and actually dealing with the person is two different things. So sometimes I think that the student, and of course the student is the, the, the consumer in all of this, doesn't really get the full benefit of what they're supposed to take away in a particular course because somebody had to come in at the very last minute, they couldn't do the, the prep that they really needed to do um, in what it is and our full time are usually extended. I mean, for most of us, we teach an overload anyway at a community college. I think it's different at a four-year institution in what you're expected to do. I know it was when I was working there. Um, so what the understanding of society, most students aren't really sure whether their person who's teaching them is full-time or an adjunct. You know, they're, they're really, they don't know. Um, they only know that if they try to get up with an adjunct who may be on campus only two hours a week uh, for whatever length of time it is. So are we shortchanging, you know, students if, you know, we have people who, as Donald was saying, are Rhodes Scholars, and I have some of those who teach at four different institutions and really can't spend a lot of time on our particular campus because they're dividing their time between other places. So there's a lot built into this that a historian in and of itself can't really address because it's logistics, it's administrative, it's legal um, laws and what they have to do. So what do we do? I mean, you know, um, the historical knowledge is there, you know, for my adjuncts, they're all very capable, uh, but that's not true across the board, not that they're not capable, but that they're not given the opportunity to fully express those capabilities because of whatever the schedule is. And, you know, yeah, you might have told them you're going to give them three classes a semester, but your enrollment says only one. And then that impacts it too, impacts how they feel about it. So we're going to our format now where you take off from where she. Okay. Okay. Um, first off, I very much appreciate your putting this session together. And I read, like, like the dialogue. <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, the, the, the point is about the impact of uh, adjunct faculty on the quality of teaching for students. And I think it's a very important to, uh, to assert that oh, I think overwhelmingly uh, part-time faculty are very dedicated teachers and very much care about their students. Um, and, that, uh, and then many uh, adjuncts, uh, I think, go to heroic efforts. Uh, to do a good job and try to rate, uh, lift up to, to the standards of the profession under uh, uh, some, some difficult uh, situations. Um, I, I think that uh, it's helpful to consider the position of part-time faculty not only in, in terms of the, the way in which they're hired for courses and the, the, the way in which they teach courses, but also their connection to the, their larger institutions. Um, in many departments, uh, part-time faculty are not part of the, really part of the department. They're not on curriculum committees. They don't tend to attend department meetings. Uh, they're not part of sort of the, the larger uh, institutional memory. I, this varies I, in my institutions. One, one institution I work for uh, is uh, very heavily uh, integrated part-timers uh, into to the department. Uh, with uh, representatives to speak at department meetings and even the architecture of our office is that we're all together, part-timers and, and full-timers full together. But I think there's no doubt that, that the job uh, restraints imposed upon part-timers uh, impairs their ability to carry out the, the quality teaching that they're very much dedicated they would like to carry out. There's another side of things I think which hasn't been examined. I'd be interested to hear from our uh, full-time uh, members of the panel. And that is the impact of the restructuring of the academic la labor force on uh, tenure track faculty. I mean, it's the tenure track faculty has shrunk in size, meaning there's fewer people to carry out traditional uh, academic responsibilities. So whether, whether it's advising or curriculum development. Um, and, uh, and I think this is probably especially acute at community colleges uh, where um, Often uh, the, in a department, uh, there may be one full-time person in a discipline in history and uh, six or eight part-timers or more, or maybe no full-time historian. And, uh, and so uh, what, uh, that's 
uh, I think would have a big impact upon the quality of history taught in that program, regardless of uh, you know how zealous the the adjunct faculty are. So. Um, my thing, my thinking is that uh, there's just a huge impact, and this is this is uh, uh, backed up by research, particularly by uh, the University of Southern California's Delphi project, uh, which has been investigating the impact of the uh, part-time uh, labor force on uh, the, the uh, student learning and student teaching, um, and a recent report adap adopt adaption by design. Um, by the Delphi project, sort of looks both sides of the coin, basically the uh, impairments on part-time faculty and also the limitations imposed upon the shrinking full-time faculty. So I think there's definitely been an impact. Sorry. No, thank you. Um, I think that it is true that in some ways, as the university becomes more dependent on non-tenure line labor, the, the various service duties of the university, more and more time that could be devoted by full-time faculty to teaching or research does get used up for other service activities. Um, I don't think that's the biggest crisis we're facing. Um, but I wanna, I wanna turn around a little bit and sort of, we've been talking about students, but I wanna talk about the other part of this question, which is the historical community, which, which is embodied in organizations like this. And I wanna suggest that we also need to think that the health of the discipline depends on the health of this community. And to understand what this community is, we, to, we have to understand what is the community we're thinking of. And I wanna posit that we are a community of historians, not professors. And the reason I think that's particularly important is that we do not want to allow a broken university to determine our relations with each other. If we think of each other as, as various classes of professors, um, created by a very inegalitarian and increasingly anti-intellectual university, we will have a certain set of relations with each other. If we think of ourselves as a community of historians rather than professors, regardless of where we work, we will really interact with each other on a different basis. And I think because the health of history in all its manifestations, including in university classrooms, depends on the health of this community, that's an important shift in how we relate to each other. We have to remember that it takes a, class, a village to produce every class, every exhibit, every documentary, every website, even every tweet. Um, and I think that the merit ideal that the university is based on does a disservice, but to invoke a famous line, we all know that we didn't build that. Every tweet requires the community that's behind it. Mm. I call this the Bill Gates fallacy. Two or three years ago, he said, and it's important because he, he gave a five-year timeline to his claim. Um, this was about two or three years ago. Five years from now, this is Bill Gates. Five years from now on the web for free, you'll be able to find the best lectures in the world. It will be better than any single university. Gates did not understand that every, behind every professor is the discipline and the health of the professoriate, but the health of the entire discipline of history and all its manifestations depends on the health of this discipline. So we need to think of ourselves as historians within the context of the OAH, even if in other contexts we think of ourselves um, in different relations to the work we do. And that requires, and maybe I'll turn it over to Robert for this, um, that we think about the kinds of work we do. If we want to value historical work rather than the fact that we're professors, the question I have is what counts as historical work? And, uh, well, I was just actually thinking, you know, how do we define what it means to be a historian? Um, that word gets awfully loaded up for me. Um, when I think about the employment picture and the decision that I took to move to K-12 teaching, um, when I was in graduate school um, in the late 80s, it was pretty clear that it was going to be, um, you know, at a sort of a if there's tears and prestige and all that, 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 that it was just gonna be forever wandering and trying to find a job. And so moving to become a secondary teacher, you know, do you leave the historian credential sort of behind? Oh yeah, I did that once, but now I am a teacher. Um, I think that if we br think broadly about what it means to be a historian and then think about including our students in that, um, to, to, to engage them to think historically, then I think we can build a big tent. Um, that's gonna be a tough thing because I think 
everybody, I'm sure there's some graduate students out here right now that are like, okay, well, who am I going to spend? You know, it's, it's who can I get on my committee and who will be my advisor and um, will a good press pick this up? I mean, the realities of those hiring committees that are in, in four-year universities and, and community colleges and, and there is such a, an overabundance of, of history PhDs that um, that makes it sort of difficult. And so it's, I always call myself a history teacher and not a, a historian, and, and that may be some, some internalized stuff on my own part. Um, but I do think that if we are going to think about, you know, so the, the question to provide historical knowledge and understanding of society broadly, I think that it's incumbent that research is important. It's critical. Um, I don't think I could be the teacher I am today without having had some exposure to the mythology of, of doing historical research. But there wasn't much emphasis in graduate work on teaching. And the reality is, is that most people are going to be in teaching positions, whether they choose my path or something, something else. And I think that will benefit us all and our students. Um, but so thank you, Miranda. Now for something different. <laughs> so obviously, the fewer trained historians there are, the less able people in general will be to think clearly about the past, to know history, to understand how to use evidence, to make informed decisions. Uh, for me, as a public historian, it's all about impact. Um, history is crucial to the civic and social well-being of communities, of people, of countries, but to all of us. Um, history has an influence on us, and explaining that is a very worthy endeavor. So where can historians have an impact? For me, that's the bottom line. Um, and historians make fantastic employees. You know, they know, <laughs> they know how to think. We use evidence, we look for counter possibilities, we can articulate a thesis, and we can disagree with each other like nobody's business. <laughs> um, and so I think the employment picture is bright, just not if you want to be in a classroom or write for a, a small number of other people. I don't know if any of you have read, I think his name is Ned Kaufman, but his piece, his, he gave a speech because it's the 50th anniversary of the Historic Preservation Act, and it's really great because it's um, and he it's got it's about the changes coming in the field of for as an example of historic preservation over the next decades with the pressures of climate change and how we're going to have to rethink what historically is significant, how we use materials, and there are so many there's such a need for historians it, throughout. American society as we start to come to grips with climate change and how we, how we retrofit our, our cities, our, all the building stock that's, that's abandoned all over the place. So, so that, and that raises a lot of issues about how are we teaching history. Um, but I, th I think history is needed everywhere, so. I'm going to start us on the next question with an uh, inserted question that can come with a very quick answer. Is there any way of being employed as an historian or history teacher that allows you to go home most nights without any work to do? <laughs> Is there anyone on this panel who goes home at five with a, that's it for the day? Has, do I have anyone who would raise his or her hand to say, Okay, so I wanted to do that just for the, we do have a few common ground items here, and what a concept to just think, okay, that day is over. Um, but since much of the time we're thinking about things that we wanted to do and like to do, it's not so bad, but that leads us to our third question. After thinking about the idea of empathy and reviewing our modestly sized packet of readings on that, what is your appraisal of the state of empathy in our profession? Are we succeeding, failing, or perhaps not yet really trying to understand each other's occupational circumstances? When you look at your fellow participants on this panel, what do you know about their working circumstances? What aspects of their lives in the profession are simply beyond your knowledge and even your imagination? So quite a few dimensions 
to that, is there anyone who would like to lead in confessing ignorance of your fellow panelists? Or Oh, I'll confess ignorance. Okay, good. Thank you, Thank you Rob. <laughs> um, well, and it's, you know, only you, you see things through the people you interact with. And I think that that is, for me, the, the, the big question about empathy in our profession. You know, um, community. I, I'm struck by this concept that we're making an assumption, and I think we're trying to tease it out, that there is a historical community that's represented by all these folks here. I, I hope that's true. Um, but we're not often in proximity with each other. And um, Zaki talks about sort of in-group, out-group, you know, that it's easier to be emp empathetic with people that you see you share a common cause with. And I know that there are those people in my life. There are public historians, there are uh, uh, old professors, and then there are people in community colleges that I, but they're, they're it's not, they're sort of, um, tangential relationships. They're not fully, I, you know, I don't feel enmeshed in that. So I, I, I know a little bit about their individual lives, but I don't know what it means to, to walk that, you know, mm -hmm. to, to be a Rhodes Scholar, to uh, have to deal with the public when, they're, when somebody says, no, this is not the way that this particular exhibit should be presented. Um, so I, are you uh, saying that that's, that we're not doing so well on empathy, but then how could we, because we live such separated work lives? Well, I think that's it. And I, you know, I heard Donald saying, you know, there are, there are universities, there are institutions where he, he, he works, where he, th he's brought into to the community and other places where it's not. And I heard um, uh, Darlene saying the same thing. Building space where we're in proximity with each other, I think will go a long way to nurturing that community and promoting the empathy, motiv that motivated empathy of, of supporting each other. And, and hopefully not, challenging each other for the limited public funds that are in existence for. Yeah, go ahead. I want to pick up on that. Um, Zaki talks about motivated empathy and then also reasons we avoid empathy. And I can say, um, I will confess, I know very little about the working lives of the people on this panel with me for the most part. Um, and I will say part of that is that I've had good fortune, I would say even good luck not to need to. Um, and, and that is something that I realized as I was reading this essay on empathy, that I think given the, the way in which prestige and status is distributed, and the way that I, ultimately getting jobs of today's days is a matter of luck, but I think because we professors like to do history from the bottom up, I think it's hard for us to acknowledge when we are sometimes in positions of privilege. But I think it's worse. I think many of us have bought into the idea of individual merit. Um, we think we actually deserve the jobs we have. We think that somehow the outcomes of the job search are just. Um, <laughs> but then we realize that to sustain our status and prestige, because there's always someone better off, we have to work really hard. We're like the American middle class, you know, being at a, being at a regional public university trying to compete at the OAH, I feel like I have to run to stay in place. Um, and so I publish and I teach. And that's all that I pay attention to. Um, and I also recognize that I don't like the way the university is going. I was Senate president last year, so I can speak from experience. We also have very limited impact as faculty on a campus, actually, that has a very strong shared governance system on some of the priorities that are redistributing resources around the universities, but within the history department, and on other parts of the university that have, that are growth centers. Um, but I think empathy is going to increase, and this is why. I think the university is increasingly an unreliable source to sustain the history discipline. We all know the story about decreasing humanities enrollments, about adjunctification. We know that there's a broader deprofessionalization of American work for teachers, think Common Core, for doctors, for journalists, for social workers, for civil servants, for professors, and we are some, in some ways harder to tailorize, but they figured out how and they're going to do it. And so I think that as we look at the future of the history discipline at a time where the future of the history professor is endangered, huh. I think the history professor has good reason to feel some empathy about people who have found other ways to engage in historical work because they may know better than we do how to sustain this discipline for the future if and when the university becomes less reliable or a more limited source of employment, and if we want to maintain the commitment 
to historical inquiry and the commitment this organization has to that. And I'll stop there. That was interesting. Yeah, Kathy, my Kathy's going to make it. I've got it. <laughs> I've got it. I want to touch upon something that you mentioned, which was Bill Gates. And what is happening in many um, institutions, whether it's a community college, whether it's four year, whatever it may be, and that's the business of becoming an institution, where they're trying to put a business model on the academic world. And we just don't fit um, into, <laughs> into that. But if they're going to give you a whole bunch of money, um, then you have to do the dance. And that, I think, impacts what goes on at different institutions. Um, you know, uh, for example, our VP of Academic Affairs um, really buys into that. She has a PhD in nursing, and she is a nurse, and so, you know, that whole structure of you've got to do this to be accredited and this, that, and the other, and she really looks upon those of us in the liberal arts as, you know, slackers. You know, we're, we're, not, <laughs> we're not meeting all of those particular things. So empathy, um, I don't think we've really looked at that as something that we should be practicing within um, the profession, regardless of where we are. Um, I think sometimes when you think you're being empathetic that someone else is going to yank your chain for that. And I know for myself, I was one time told that, well, you're mothering your students when I didn't think that I was doing that at all, I thought I was being responsive to their particular needs. Um, so I think, that, I don't think we're there. I don't, I don't think that we've really looked at this and hopefully out of this discussion, we can approach it. But then I will also say that out of our uh, meeting this morning that one of uh, the uh, attendees did say that she was, felt far more welcoming in OAH than she did in other of the professional organizations because they welcomed everyone the high school teachers, community college, you know, graduate students, et cetera. So there has to be some empathy that we've been expressing, regardless of how small it might have been. Okay. Uh, Robert, Catherine's going to go into what? Well, no, I was just moving was it back. Yeah. I'm done. So you can go into it. Catherine wanted to make a response yeah. there. No, that's okay. Um, so in, in my opinion, one of the biggest indicators of the state of empathy is that we don't generally value or reward mentoring. Um, I don't really have a theory about why mentoring is so seldom or poorly done. Um, it's not often valued by those who should be mentors, and it's certainly not taught as part of graduate training or used for tenure, unless you count service, you stick it in service. Um, Mentoring is especially not done across types of institutions or across, for lack of a better term, diversity categories. It's rare that you mentor someone who you don't see yourself in, who doesn't look like you. Um, it's not expected, and I think that's why things have changed so little within the history profession. There is no presumption that our community has responsibility to ensure each other's safety, well-being, our in, the intellectual growth of our colleagues, or that we share resources with each other. Um, as to the part about understanding what various parts of the profession do, I will say that when at the museum, when we invite academics to advise us on projects, the the museum people frequently have to carry most of the water and handhold for people. <laughs> Academic colleagues don't really understand how to read a script or use non-prose evidence. Well, they feel really comfortable with a script because there's a lot of words and words are comforting and familiar, but a script is only one piece of it. There are objects, there's design, and then there's the audience that you have to put into the mix. So, so just like reading a script is like reading every fourth page of a monograph and trying to understand it. But um, so, Although I do teach 
at, I do teach at a university, so I have some understanding, and I, I'm, uh, I am an adjunct, but I'm not called that because I'm, I have a full-time job at the museum, so I have a fancier title, but I, I started out as an adjunct um, years ago. But as for my fellow panelists, I don't know what keeps all of you up at night. I don't, I don't know what makes you do a happy dance or, or whether you are fearful at work or not. Um, I don't know what you wish you had more time for with your students. Um, that kind of familiarity comes with friendship. Um, and I bet that for most of us, we're so busy Try, we're like overworked and we're trying to make sure our charges get what they need from us, that friendship is kind of secondary. And especially if you're teaching at four schools, it's hard to have time for friendship, so. I'd like to respond to a number of really good points from my uh, fellow panelists. Um, uh, beginning with um, Dr. Neem's uh, point about in-groups and out-groups, in-groups and out-groups, which is a, a major point by, made by, uh, I think he's a social neuroscientist, uh, Zaki. Um, I mean, arguing that it's, more, it's much easier to have empathy for one who is an in-group uh, uh, than those in an out-group. And sometimes those in an out-group may be treated uh, in, a, in, in an exploited way. Um, I think that the structure of our profession sort of creates these in-groups and out-groups, particularly uh, in the way that the, the university is balkanized. And I, I agree, I, I have only the vaguest ideas of uh, you know, the, the challenges and the aspirations that my fellow panelists have because of the sort of very small uh, world uh, in, in which I live. Um, however, uh, one place where I would see a ray of hope is in, in professional organizations. Uh, and not only this one, which I, I think is, uh, is uh, genuinely uh, open-minded and growing, uh, but also uh, local uh, historical organizations. And i just tell you a story about a recent experience I had in Connecticut. Um, uh, Connecticut's uh, uh, going through a budgetary crisis, and uh, the governor has proposed a budget which will zero out all state funding for historical uh, programs. Zero out. And, um, uh, this has brought the historical community together, and uh, uh, as you might imagine. And uh, last, uh, you know, just uh, uh, a week, uh, two weeks ago, uh, there was a rally at the state capitol uh, in Hartford, uh, bringing uh, you know people from different walks of life, and you know, museum people, and uh, historical societies, and college professors, uh, basically trying to get together, you know, and try to make the case to the legislature that this very small amount of money that has been traditionally uh, allocated for history should go on. I mean, uh, it's only it's only uh, several million dollars out of a, you know the 20 billion dollar state budget. Um, and one thing that we learned about from that is to be how much we have in common. Um, and that, uh, I mean, not only do we do history, but I think that there's a, a strong passion to do history well, to uphold standards, and, uh, and uh, to, uh, uh, to present history in an interesting and engaging way uh, that, that's, that's quite accurate. And so I think one area, I mean, where empathy uh, can be uh, cultivated is uh, uh, maybe not in the university, which again is very balkanizing, but in professional organizations and professional societies. Uh, we, did you want, no, okay. So uh, we have one more question we'll do up here and then we're ready to go over to questions after that. I wanna say that I have such an excellent corrective over the pattern of thought of believing in the meritocracy and thinking that hirings are reasonable. I have my job at the University of Colorado. Richard White, the Western historian, was my competitor. My colleagues, apparently this may be folklore, but my colleagues were not necessarily very taken with me, but they did not see it as right in 1983 for uh, Richard to have such long hair. So apparently that was my competitive advantage there, was that it's okay, I still have him here, it's good. Uh, but the reasons why I got the job didn't add to my sense of, well, I tell you, really, the talent will out, won't it? It's so arbitrary. So it's, I'm actually a little bit grateful, and Richard, of course, has managed to power on and have quite a successful career, but it has always struck me as, 
valuably humbling to have that. So here is our last uh, item up here, and then please, audience, prepare soon to join us in the conversation. Uh, the fourth question, do you, feel, do you yourself feel a connection to the history profession as a network of people in different sectors and forms of employment, but engaged in a common cause of enhancing citizens' understanding of history? If your answer is no or partially no, what adjustments, reforms, or changes would make it possible for you to feel a sense of historians as a united team? That's a pretty cheery promise of reform there. So reformers, who is our leading reformer? Oh, there's Catherine, she's. <laughs> so, um, I feel deeply connected to history. Um, but only half connected to the profession. And being, being invited to participate on this plenary makes me uncomfortable a bit, and because it must be what it feels like to be an insider. And I'm usually, I see all you about out there, which is where I usually, <laughs> usually am, like muttering under my breath about what people are saying and have a running commentary in my head about what's happening. And so it's pretty strange to be up here on, on this side, because this is what insiders do. And I, I, you know, they speak for others and, and act like pals with everybody, which is, I always find very off-putting and offensive. So I'm, I'm like one of them. <laughs> um, it's unsettling. Um, and even though my, Smithsonian job and my whiteness are kind of mark me as potentially the ultimate insider. Um, so I, I think that's one of the things one, that the OAH can do with us. It, I love the OAH and I love coming here and, and being forced to be on a program committee with people from all over that you've never met but you have to come to decisions with. Or being on a panel like this, I think, is, is, is as Donald said, it's one of the one of the transformative, or not. That's a little strong. It's one. Of, it's one of the benefits um, of being in an inst of a in an organization like this. But then it leads to questions about who's not here because they're teaching, or they're traveling, or they don't have the money to be here. They can't afford the plane fare or the registration. So there, for every plus, there's a question of how can we make this organization as beautiful as it can be. So there's a t it's a two-part question. Do you feel connected to the historic history profession? And if no, what adjustments can be made? Um, so I'm not sure how to answer the second one because my answer to the first one is absolutely yes. I feel very connected to the history profession, but I want to qualify that. As I've become more engaged with the OAH and with Shear, I'm an early American historian, so Society for Historians of the Early American Republic, I've felt much more connected to being a historian who's part of a larger professional community. But to invoke Robert Putnam's framing of social capital, it's been bonding rather than bridging social capital. It's been a kind of connection that's brought me closer to working with more of my tenure line and tenured faculty friends, uh, but has done nothing, particularly um, this panel being an exception, to bridge to other uh, people who work in the profession. So I've, it's brought me closer to the profession in a way that's bonded me closer to my fellow tenure line professors. Um, how to change that? would be, again, to raise the question of what is historical work. As long as published scholarship is the gold standard, I'm not sure how to change that. Um, conferences are formative. They form us as subjects. They form our subjectivity. And I think one way to think about the question is, is the conference for the people in the audience, or is it for the panelists? If the gold standard scholarship, in some ways, it's to have a community in which the panelists can get good feedback and critical feedback on their work. Often we use it to show off, but it should be actually to, to engage in productive scholarly work. And as, but in the sense that the conferences engage in some ways, if you look at the panels, to produce knowledge and receive feedback on knowledge, 
the subject, the kind of subject it's celebrating are those who, and it's forming through, through our being here, are people who produce knowledge. And so that's scholarship once again. And so I think deeply embedded in the sort of cultural practices of the conference is what ultimately values according to the discipline. And so yes, it's made me closer as I become more involved to the discipline, but it's also increased in some ways perhaps the divide. And the answer would be to question, if we need to question it, and that I don't know, what counts as historical work. Okay. <laughs> Connection to history, yes. And I don't think any of us who teach history would say that we're not connected to it because we do that because we really love what we do. <coughs> That's the bottom line. Um, in different sectors, I think it depends upon where you are, where you're working, um, what interaction that you have with other people. Um, for myself, I've had a lot of interaction with archivists. Um, so I understand what they do and appreciate you know, their particular work. Um, I have done a number of invited speaking engagements to community uh, organizations about various and sundry different things that they're interested in, church groups. And, you know, I feel honored when I'm asked to do that because they're valuing me as the person who comes to tell them something that they want to know. Um, museum work, I have worked with some people who that's what they want to go in with. Um, that, you know, I've had students say, I want to go into museum work. And I don't understand all of that work, but I certainly appreciate it because I love museums. You know, I love what they do and what they offer the world and all these visitors to do that. High school, um, this is why I went to get graduate degrees. <laughs> so I didn't teach in high school because I substitute taught and really, you know, didn't want to do that. Adjunct, yeah, I spent years as an adjunct. Uh, how do we unite all of these various parts? Well, I think you're correct in um, saying that it's these organizations that bring all of the various people together, whether it's the large ones like OAH and AAH or your local ones, um, smaller ones, specific ones where you're talking about uh, the early Republic historians and I belong to the Southern historians and. Uh, and Asawa, you know, so they, that brings people together. But when you are in those more specific organizations, you are interacting with people who have your interests. You know, the, that's what you, you do. So, you know, how do we do that? I think OAH's topics sometimes are the thing that bring various groups together. Um, like the taboo, you know, there are people who came here and offered things that I wouldn't have thought about. You know, but this is what they're doing, so it makes it more interesting. And I think that those themes with that, what OAH does, and some of the other smaller organizations are very important on unifying uh, people who um, maybe are not really working in the profession, but you know, have a total vested interest in history and want to be part of that. I feel very uh, connected to uh, the history profession um, and uh, as an adjunct. Um, but that may say a lot about me because I try to get I get my fingers in a lot of uh, things, um, uh, with you know with uh, the local historical associations. I try to do a little scholarship, um, very devoted to my students. Um, um, but I would say this: uh, I think that the the point about scholarship and knowledge creation being the gold standard. I don't know if it's the gold standard, but I think it is one of the criteria for being uh, in historical profession. And I think that that's sort of one area where I, where I think adjuncts may feel somewhat frustrated, that, uh, that there's a little help or um, appreciation for um, the effort uh, of adjuncts to uh, participate in the process of creating new scholarship and writing articles and gi giving papers. Um, uh, and uh, and uh, so in terms of what we might do uh, uh, differently, I, I have two suggestions. Um, one is I think that um, OEH can continue to try to open the doors and make uh, uh, OEH accessible to part-timers to participate, come to conferences, and uh, may, you know, maybe present papers here. I think uh, OEH has made some big strides, and I have to compliment uh, the, the OEH board and uh, uh, past presidents and current presidents uh, for support 
a, a part-time faculty, and I think, but we think we can go further. The second suggestion is uh, I, I would not give up on the university. Uh, I mean, I may, university may be broken, but I think uh, that there may be ways that even a professional association like OEH can go push back uh, to the, uh, and to, 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 for changes in the way uh, that contingent jobs are, are structured. Uh, we're talking the, about you know basic things like job security, longer term term employments, uh, uh, employments, uh, a higher salary, some benefits. So uh, contingent faculty can can be the kind of professionals that professionals that we want them to be. Um, yeah, I think to quickly answer, um, I feel a partial connection, um, and some of those mentoring relationships and friendships that uh, Catherine had mentioned earlier. I'm lucky enough to have some of those in my own world. A museum educator reached out to me, a, a university professor, you know, that those connections exist. I think, and this panel is a great demonstration of some of the ways that that might continue to work. I mean, intentionality um, of trying to build bridging capital as opposed to bonding capital, finding out ways, thinking about who's not in the room and what might bring them in. And maybe, and also, so, if, if scholarship's not just going to be the gold standard, how does the OAH think about its position, you know, at local universities? You know, how do you get people together? How do you get people across the spectrum together? You know, it might just be getting some beer in your backyard. Um, it may not have to be too expensive. But to think about ways, because it's those informal relationships that have opened up opportunities to do some really profound thinking and work with professors and professionals and, and, and public ed, uh, historians that have helped me grow over the last two and a half decades as a, you know, to still feel connected to the history profession, although sometimes in a tenuous way. Uh, I am gonna say a word on interdisciplinary opportunity because at the Center of the American West at the University of Colorado, our faculty affiliates include part-time and contingent instructor, we don't, uh, they're called faculty affiliates. The students is, uh, students don't care about the rank or notice that. So we have, in an interdisciplinary center as opposed to a department, we can just throw rank around. We can just uh, scramble that. And so that has been a pleasure. I'm going to suggest that Sam and her, if, you, if two promising, important scholars of the future from CU, if you could pass around the Jim Barrett uh, proposal, that might be an interesting thing. And now we are uh, ready to go on an uh, audience, yeah.
Yeah, I, I am a big fan of social engineering, and I would be perfectly happy to say that there will be a premium, premium in accepting proposals to a program committee if you have scrambled the categories of your participants. It's not that you will be penalized if everybody is of the same rank or anything like it, but you will rise to the top of the selection process. And sadly, I am rotating out of office as president, so that's a really interesting idea. But I don't know why we can't, as a group of people in a room, decide to do that, to decide that the next time we propose a session, we scramble the categories and have the mixture of approaches and disciplines. So I think that's a lovely idea. Yeah, well, here, and, and don't leave the room until you've formed your panel proposal for the next session on that uh, in the orange scarf. So there you are. That would be. We just say here, here, or do you? <laughs> well, I, um, I've never met this woman before in my life. Um, <laughs> well, but to, to be honest, I mean, my trajectory to this spot here probably started with a project that Laura did. Oh. Um, oh. And you know, my my reentry and thinking about what it means to be an educator, both a high school educator and then an educator of, of pre-service teachers. So, um, and part of the reason for that, so I've never met this one, no, um, is that when Laura approached those projects, and I think this was, it was a democratic process, um, that people at all levels, and so we were in projects where there were elementary school teachers, secondary school teachers, university folks from all over, and um, part of it is the intentionality to go back again to say that I'm going to create a space where everybody's going to be valued around that work. Um, and I think there's lots of local projects, and part of it is also hanging out and and that's where the mentorship and the friendships develop. Um, we have lots of resources with TAH. Do this work. Right. Right. And yeah. those who did it, um, you know, found that there was some value in talking about mm -hmm. boundaries. But I guess I challenge us to think about what are, one, the common problems, projects facing the profession, and what are the local projects. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah. So the lady in blue. Thank you. 
I understand your point about per, uh, perhaps not be more aggressive about the points we made, but I, I, I personally tried to be a little more low key. Um, um, but I think the second point is that um, there certainly are people who are making known to undergraduates uh, the, the composition of their fa faculty. Um, there, you know, of course, is uh, uh, you know. The, uh, the AUP holds a campus equity week every year on, on one, one of my campuses. Uh, we have a table in the student center where we talk about uh, part-time faculty. Just a few weeks ago, you probably know, there was a wildcat, you know, national adjunct walkout uh, day. Um, there are no walkouts that I know of, but the point it became an occasion uh, for adjuncts to make their, their presence known. And on my particular campus, one of my campuses, uh, the faculty held a grade-in. Basically to, uh, to, to basically to make the point about uh, adjuncts do a lot of work that uh, is not comp they don't get compensated for. So I mean there are those who certainly are trying to educate students and to find some common ground. Uh, I mean, the, uh, the underpayment of adjuncts is linked to uh, you know the uh, rising student uh, tuitions um, you know, because of the way that universities are being financed. So, so I mean there is, there is, there is uh, uh, some agitation. On the third point, I can't speak to graduate education so. No, I think, I think your points are very well taken. Um, I think, you know, I think um, on the latter part on graduate education, I certainly, when I have undergraduates come to me want to go to grad school, I read them the Riot Act. And it often ends up crying, quite honestly, on not their part, but mine, at how much I have to convince a really excited, good student about how terrible an idea it is to become a historian. Um, and they're in shock and I'm in tears because I'm telling someone very promising that this is a profession that's not going to make it. And so I guess I think on one hand we do fight for the university because the university has been the source of funding for the discipline. But we have to be aware of the trends in the larger political economy we're working. And I just think if we want the discipline to work, there are two options. We can do what the AHA is doing, which I think is not the right thing, which is say, you know, historians are better MBAs than MBAs. But I think the better answer is we have to figure out, and a lot of this may come from private philanthropy, we have to figure out how to sustain historical inquiry and historical work as, at least for a while, the university is not the place that's going to fund that work. And that's going to take some creative energy. But I think a lot of people in America who have, who have wallets full of money um, want to fund some kind of historical work. And so I think we need to think about how do we sustain history? Um. Uh, yes, in, in the red check. Um, thank you for all of your comments, everyone. Uh, I have a couple of observations and a question related to some of the uh, uh, last few comments. But first of all, thank you for highlighting Bill Gates. I think it's important to note that the person that made that observation himself dropped out of college. So his perception of what a good college teacher looks like may be skewed. Uh, secondly, 
will say I uh, was a tenured full professor before I went lateral and did all kinds of applied public engagement things. I think I was, I don't know what would have happened to me if I had not been in that position. And it seems preposterous to say to someone, get a PhD, work your way up the ladder, and when you're about 45, you can do what you want to do. I, uh, Sam Bach over there works at the Center of the American West, the one who was handing out the sheets, and it is certainly my hope that Sam Bach, by working at the Center of the American West and seeing money come in there from time to time, uh, perhaps not as often as we would like, but, but I hope that Sam is having a valuable lifelong experience in thinking there are lots of things to do. If I, he, he recently read a young adult novel that was set in a historical uh, well, story, and so he read it very care carefully, and he gave the author advice, who was trying to do the right thing historically, and, and you, did, you got some money, right? You got some money. And he had an ecstatic author of the young adult thing just saying, thank you for Sam. And so that's a kind of weird experience, but it, it seems uh, there's just, a, I'm, I'm with Catherine that with some enterprise and flexibility and originality, there's a lot of things to do. However, that wasn't your question. Will the reward system adjust to that? Anybody who has ever been in front of a public audience talking about a historical issue that has contemporary implications for our dilemmas knows that that is much harder intellectual work than presenting a paper at a conference. That's called service. That's called like, I don't know what, it's called like some pleasant volunteer activity of a light nature. The adrenaline in your system, if you measure by adrenaline, that's, and, and when you figure something out, it's a big thing, it's a really big thing. So I don't know what to do with the people, I, I would say if you've had that experience and it's the life of public historians, uh, when you've had it, it's so addictive and it's so exhilarating that it's unbelievable that we wouldn't value that and, and give opportunities for it. But if you haven't had that experience, then you don't support the cause of changing the reward system. And I don't know what to do. We could kidnap people and put them in front of exhilarating adrenaline. I have been expressing yearnings and desire for that since before, long before Ken Jackson gave that speech. And I don't know, I'm sorry to be a little bit glum on that, but, well. Can I be contrary? Oh, please, yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't think we should. Um, I think that at some level, the, the, I mean, I think we should to the level that tenure, and service, tenure should include service and teaching. Um, and, but I think that to some extent, the existence of the discipline of history and all modern disciplines are to produce new knowledge. And, and so the gold standard is not arbitrary. The distribution of resources to produce that work is arbitrary, um, or certainly un unjust. But at some level, why did the discipline of history organize itself, or the discipline of economics, or the, all of these, was to produce scholarly knowledge, right? They were philosophical enterprises. And so while we should all value the work we do um, as teachers in various ways, and our local institutions where we're based should value the work we do, the purpose of the discipline of history in some ways is scholarly production. And so that is not an arbitrary gold standard, I think. Uh, so you, there's, which one did you think? Oh, the one in the very back, okay. That's excellent. I, I do want to accent that notion that we are practitioners of empathy because we're always trying to figure out what those dead people were thinking or feeling, and that is a 
that's intense and that's ready to be picked up and moved over there. I don't, I'm, I said to the uh, panelists, I thought this was an important occasion. I would like to do it. If we had 22 people join us, I was going to be happy with, with that. And we had cons considerably more of you than that. But I, as a person living at low level, sometimes low level, sometimes mid level, chronic panic over the state of the profession, I could, if I had not been the organizer of this, you couldn't have kept me out of here. It would be just, okay, how do we get this back together? And people have busy lives, and, and it's the bar. Oh, good Lord, would you look at the time? My goodness, people have been in bars for a while now, and we've been here drinking little cups of water. So, so if anybody has thoughts about, about what might have changed that, uh, I don't know. But, it's a, but I appreciate you bringing that up. Uh, and then, then in the white sweater, did you have your hand? No, did you have? Oh, okay. Oh, Amy? Amy. I, I, I'm um, the president of my local union. I wanted to say something about uh, Jim Barrett's unionization. And um, I'm the president of AFT Local 1950 at Shoreline Community College, which represents all of the So the bad news is that um, we are out of time, and we do have this room held so that we can continue conversations. I do have my thoughts about my past presidential life. You have to be on the stay for two years as a past president, so I've got to find something to do. So I'm hoping that I can work with Jim Barrett on how to have different versions of that, different forms of persuasion, but something, and, and I may not jo join up totally on the collective bargaining thing, I don't know, but I'm hoping that I can take that up. And so that puts me in a position where I can be receptive and responsive to any more thoughts people have about, well, for heaven's sake, anything that you didn't get to say, and I know there are many people who had things worth saying, uh, patricia.limerick at colorado.edu, very intuitive. Uh, Please, please write me about that. And now I want to say the obvious thing that I put these people in a kind of weird and uncomfortable position by asking them, this is not, you will speak for your category. These are individuals. These have their own experience. But to accept my invitation and to come up here and take part in this conversation, I feel was a great act on their part. And so can we thank them for that? <laughs>